Chapter 6. Man Pays Us Some Attention The Scribe's Note on Chapter 6 Men found that by exhausting the air from glass globes or tubes, it was possible to pass electric discharges through them, and in so doing, some very beautiful luminous effects were produced within the vacuum tubes. It was when experimenting with one of these tubes that a scientist suggested that radiant particles were being shot across the tube. These particles were really electrons, but it was thought at that time that they were atoms of matter. Another scientist declared, from certain mathematical calculations, that there existed extremely small particles of something around the atoms of matter, and that it was the motion of these in the ether which produced light. People were not willing to accept this theory. Some time later, another scientist was able to prove by experiment that these particles did exist. This was done by means of the spectroscope, as will be related by the electron in a later chapter. End of Scribe's Note From the little I have told you already of our experiences, you will see that men had been making many experiments in which we electrons took a very active part. It was disappointing that even though we had surprised man in so many different ways, he had never become suspicious of our presence. One day, however, we did begin to hope for recognition. I was present with a great crowd of electrons, imprisoned within a glass globe from which the air had been extracted. We were very pleased to find that the surrounding space had been cleared of air, for it was apparent that the experimenter was going to make us jump across from one end of the glass tube to the other. A crowd of us had collected on the extremity of a wire, or electrode, at the one end of the tube, while another similar crowd was present on the other electrode at the opposite end of the tube. While I speak of a crowd, meaning that there were millions of us, I do not suggest that we were overcrowded, for we had plenty of elbow-room to move about on the atoms to which we were attached. All in a moment the scene was changed. We felt a crowd of electrons pressing us forward and forcing us right up to the very end of the electrode. We found that the crowd was approaching by a wire leading into the tube. Soon the crowding had reached such a condition that we became alarmed. We could see no way of escape. We were imprisoned by the glass walls, but we soon discovered that many of the electrons who had been stationed on the other electrode had deserted their post and fled along a wire leading out of the tube. If we could only follow them! It would be a tremendous jump to get over to the other wire, but the way was fairly clear of air. When the overcrowding reached a certain point, we were literally shot across from the one electrode to the other. This was the first time I had ever experienced anything of the kind, but many fellow electrons had gone through similar performances for years at the hands of other experimenters. However, it was somewhat alarming to be fired off like a rocket across the tube. What happened after that I cannot recollect, but some time later I was present in that or a similar tube when I heard the experimenter say to a friend that he believed there were particles flying across his tube. We sent news all along the line, stating that at last we had been discovered, and I can assure you that we felt proud. But our joy was not long-lived, for it turned out that we were considered to be particles or atoms of matter. The experimenter spoke of us as radiant matter. This was a real disappointment. It took us some time to recover from our disappointment at being mistaken for clumsy atoms of matter. We are of a higher order of things altogether. No atom of matter can travel at speed such as we can. We cross these vacuum tubes with speed equal to millions of miles per minute. A great many of us were kept busy within vacuum tubes by other experimenters, but nothing very exciting happened. Indeed, we had lost all hope of attracting man's attention to ourselves as long as we were imprisoned within these tubes. In the meantime, our hopes were revived by news which reached us from another quarter. We heard that a very learned man had declared boldly that there did exist little particles which revolved around the atoms of matter, and that it was the motion of these tiny particles in the ether which produced the well-known waves of light. There was considerable rejoicing among us, for we were anxious to have our services recognized by man. This great man was not guessing merely. He was willing to prove by mathematical calculations that we did exist in reality. 
Of course, we ourselves required no proof of our existence, but we believed that man would be convinced. Our high hopes were soon laid low. News reached us that people were shaking their heads and saying that figures could be made to prove anything. After we had settled down to our ordinary duties, we got word that at last man had really detected us in a flame of gas. This seemed quite reasonable, for, as I shall relate to you in another chapter, we have a very lively time of it in a flame of gas. However, when we were informed that man had discovered us by means of a sort of telescope arrangement, I, for one, began to doubt the truth of the discovery. Some time before this, I had heard that men were spying at gas flames in the hope of finding us, and this seemed most ridiculous, for if man could not see the large congregations of us called atoms, how could he expect to see individual electrons? My ignorance was dispelled when it was explained that man had not been looking for us directly, but for the ether waves which we produce. But I have not had an opportunity of explaining to you how some of us produce waves in the ether. I shall have to wait till a later chapter. In the meantime, I may say that since this important discovery, I have taken some part in an experiment similar to the historic one wherein we were detected. But of that, too, I shall have more to say again. The rejoicing at this discovery was not confined to us, for men of science were quick to grasp the importance which was attached to this new knowledge. We felt that man was bound to acknowledge our services from that day. The next event was our christening, and this was not all plain sailing. Indeed, we have been rather annoyed with one name which some good friends persist in giving us. I refer to the name Corpuscle, which we feel to be a sort of nickname, although it may have been suggested in all kindness. It may be difficult for you to appreciate our dislike to this name but it seems to us to savor too much of material things. It is not dignified. You must remember, we are not matter. We are delighted with what we prefer to call our real name, Electron, for that speaks of electricity. As you know, we are units of particles of negative electricity, and so this seems a most sensible and suitable name. But I must hasten to tell of some of our everyday duties in which we serve man. End of chapter 6